Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Chicago Ions and welcome back because we had a two month hiatus uh, this summer and uh, I'm feeling better. I'm still in recovery mode, but I'm feeling better. And so uh, we're moving forward and we will start this meeting like we start all of our meetings with a few minutes of meditative reflection and I'll be playing my native flute. So if you want to get yourself in a comfortable position and if you have things on your lap, you might want to move them off, and get yourself in a situation where you can relax and allow your eyes to gently close. And to the place that you go when you go. Welcome back. I'm so grateful that we have Anne today. She was our speaker last time was I think 2015. And we had a wonderful time. She was here in Chicago and uh, went, we went to the Church of the Spirit and she spoke there. It was a great weekend and I have wonderful memories. And I'm just so uh, happy that she could come and be with us again. She's got lots of interesting new information to give us about her new book and, uh, and her two near-death experiences. And I'm so, 
so wonderfully happy to have you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to her and see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. I, I really did enjoy my time coming to Chicago to visit with Chicago Ions. It was incredible event. Um, people really turn out to learn more. And um, I have served on the board of IONS, uh, the international organization. I'm now serving on the board of Spiritual Awakenings International. And I'm thrilled that organizations like this exist so that people who are having um, spiritually transformative experiences have somewhere to go to participate and be with like-minded souls and learn more and um, discover more. Because when my experiences began, I knew very little. I was born in South Carolina. I was raised as a Southern Baptist, but my spiritual experiences began from the time that I was really little. My mother said, by the time I could string two sentences together that I had asked her um, to help me, I said, I've forgotten something very important and I need to talk to God. Do you know how to talk to God? And I actually believe that that is the state that every one of us is in. Um, we are looking for that guidance. We're looking for that connection and it is available to us. And I firmly believe that. I, I learned to listen as a child. I began to hear my guidance, but still I was searching for what it was I had forgotten. Recently, I shared with Spiritual Awakenings International the story of five blue rings. And that's the subject of my new book that's coming out that I co-wrote with my husband. It's at fiveblueRings.com. And today I wanna to focus on my near-death experiences since this is IONS. And um, because I've had some very interesting ones. Um, very unusual, and and I hope that um, your viewers can learn some things that uh, they might pick up that might be new and interesting to them today. But I want to go back to there I was as a child, um, knowing I'd forgotten something, wanting to be in touch with God, and you know, I had experience after experience after experience. I began to hear things. I began to know things. I obviously was just tuned in from an early age. But um, later, I became a high school teacher. And in my classroom, amazing things began to happen. And I want to tell you what the catalyst was for that, because I think this is something that people can take note of, because it changed my life. Because I was such a young teacher, I graduated with my bachelor's degree at 21. I was already had finished my, um, my bachelor's at 21, my master's by the time I was 22. And, um, and so I started teaching when I was 21 years old and I taught high school and my students were 17 and 18 years old. So I was only a few years older than they were. And I was teaching English with a lot of philosophy mixed in. And my students would say to me, what do you believe? Because they really wanted to know what, what is truth. And they wanted to examine what they believed. But I didn't really know. Remember, I was raised as a Southern Baptist in South Carolina. So what did I know? And even though I was college educated and I, I knew philosophy and different people's point of view and, and I read a lot of literature, I still didn't know where to hang my hat for truth. So I began in the tradition of my Christian faith to say a little prayer before every single class came in for their high school classes in English. I would say, dear God, teach me truth so that I may teach them truth. Next hour, I would say the prayer. Dear God, teach me truth so that I may teach them truth. And on every hour, on the hour, seven hours a day, that was my prayer. It went on day after day after day, but it didn't take long till something happened. I put my hand to the board to write a quote. And instead, my hand started writing wildly all sorts of things that I wasn't aware of. I, I didn't know this was automatic writing, 
But another thing that happened in the classroom was that my students who were sitting there when this was happening, um, they began to describe uh, becoming smarter, more aware, more capable. And they knew that there was something mystical going on in the classroom. They called that experience being quickened. So we recognized that the flow of spirit was coming into the classroom. And I knew that for me, from my perspective, it came because of that prayer, dear God, teach me truth. That's what was happening. And truth was manifesting on my board. We didn't have computers, so I sent those quotes away. And I heard from the research librarian at Indiana University that this is from Aristotle and Plato and lost epistles of Plato. I certainly don't have that memorized, but she said it was written perfectly. And she said, how could you have the quote if you don't know where it came from? And I said, I, I said, it's sort of a game. If you'll use your computer and keep researching, you know, I'll keep sending them. But it went on for years. And now I'm going to describe to you one of the other events that happened because just as my students said they were being quickened, I was being quickened as well. And it was a powerful um, experience that was going on. Many things were happening. This is the... Um, middle of the first year of teaching, I was about to go to my master's degree class because I was teaching all day and I'm studying at night to get my master's degree. So I'm 21 years old and sitting in my living room, my boyfriend came over and we're sitting there chatting. I said, I don't have much time. I have to leave for class. And he said, that's okay. He said, I just wanted to talk before you left and say hello. And all of a sudden I turned to him and I said, do you feel all right? And he said, yeah, I feel fine, why? And I said, I feel like someone is dying. And he said, dying? He said, do you feel all right? And I said, yeah, I feel fine. But no, it's a terrible feeling like somebody is dying right now. And, and then I said to him, oh my gosh, hold me, hold my body. And my body began to shake all over. And he put his arms around me, but he was really concerned. And he said, did you do some drugs? <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't do any drugs, but something is happening to me. Just hold on to me. The next thing I know, I look and in my living room, I said, do you see that? Do you see that? There's a little black spot right in the middle of the room, hanging right in the middle of space. And he said, no, I don't see a black spot. Are you sure you didn't do any drugs? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't do anything. I'm about to go to class. And then I said, oh my gosh, I am being sucked out of my body. Just hold my body. And I felt myself moving toward that black hole. And at first it was like a pinpoint, but it grew bigger and bigger and bigger and then <laughs> I went straight into it, into the black tunnel, and I am having a near-death experience. But I know it's not me. Somebody else is dying, and I am there with them, but I have no idea who it is. But suddenly, I'm moving through this beautiful space, and there's light, and I'm out of the dark tunnel. And wherever I am, all I know is I want to stay here forever. I loved the feeling that I was having. It was peaceful, it was beautiful. I felt fulfilled, I felt like I was at home. And then I saw before me a magnificent waterfall, the most huge and beautiful waterfall imaginable. And it appeared to be made out of light. And it had this sound that came from it as well. And the sound was magnificent and pulling on me. And I, I went toward that waterfall of light and sound. And I heard a voice say, this is the ocean of mercy and love. And I realized I was standing in it, a beautiful ocean. But instead of being water, it was as if it were pure light and with this radiant musical sound coming from it. And I thought, this is the light and sound of God. And I don't know how I got here, but I wanna stay here forever. And I felt like I had made a decision and I would not change my mind. 
I am going to stay right here forever. And as if my very thoughts are heard really clearly, I hear, you must return when you are told to do so. And I said, I don't want to. I want to stay here forever. Don't worry, I said, I won't ask for anything. I, I'll just stand here. You can just ignore me. I'll just be here forever and ever. And the voice said, when you are told, you must return. And the voice was neither male nor female. It came as if it were a wind that went through me, but I could hear it like language very clearly, very distinctly. And then I was told that there is much to be done and much that you must do. And when you return, you must follow all instructions as they are given. And I said, no, I don't want to. Now I admit, I'm gonna confess to you, this is extremely selfish. I am standing in what I believe is the presence of God. I am having the most delightful, amazing experience that I could ever imagine. And I am selfishly saying, I'll take charge now and do what I want to do. And I just want to stay here. So kindly leave me alone. That's basically what I was saying. The voice is patient, but very firm. You must return and you will. So I, I realize I'm being told I'll have no choice, but I, uh, I definitely begged. I begged to be able to stay there. But then I hear the voice with the delivery that was very precise and very intense. And it said, there are 10 things that you must remember. And I, I have a copy of them here so I can get them right for you. I wanna share them exactly as I received them. Number one, although you have absolutely no intellectual knowledge of what is occurring here, someone very close to you appears to be dying. And so you see, here I am in a near death shared experience, and I don't know who the person is. I don't know what's going on, but it's that feeling that I had before I went through the black tunnel that somebody was dying. But number two says, in truth, there is no death, only the illusion of death. Now, for many people who follow Ions um, and I in Chicago, this is a common concept that is deeply believed, but I had no idea. Of course there's death, people die, but no, there is no death. There is only the illusion of death. And as I heard that second concept being presented to me, I felt it to the core of my being, oh my gosh, we've been mistaken. And all the fear and the dread and the worry, it's not real. This is all an illusion. Number three built on that, however, it says, upon learning of this apparent death, you must go at once to this person. So I was to return. And when I learned who it was that appeared to be dying, I was to go to them. Number four, in order to help them, you will be instructed and you must follow all instructions as they are given. Now I'm going to confess to you again that what I was thinking is they can give these instructions to someone else because I'm just gonna stay here. I don't wanna go. Number five, it continues, you must tell everyone concerned, this is not death. Number six, after this experience, this person will be better off than ever before. Number seven, however, to you, it will not appear to be so. Number eight, you must leave here when you are told to go, although you will not wish to you must go. Number nine, you have much to do. You must listen carefully and do everything as you are instructed. 
Now, this becomes the basis of inner guidance that I believe that we all have, that these instructions are constantly being given, especially if we ask for them. Now, remember, I had asked, teach me truth. And boy, is truth pouring into me. Number 10, remember, everything is always happening exactly as it should, whether it appears that way or not. And isn't that a telling message? Everything is always happening exactly as it should, whether it appears that way or not. So these words were flowing through me. It was beautiful. I was absolutely taken with the beauty of it, but I was indifferent to the message because I had other plans. I had decided to stay that somehow kicking and screaming, I would remain here. And so inwardly, I said, you should find someone else to do this. Let them take the message. And I, I know it was childish. I was only concerned with my own self-satisfaction. I know that I thought shamelessly, well, if there is no death, even though this person appears to be dying, anybody could give this message. It doesn't have to be me. And yet I was not aware that each soul is guided and directed as they are needed based on their own state of consciousness, the vibration, the frequency that they carry. I was completely unaware of any of that. So I begged again, I won't ask for a thing. Please let me stay. Someone else can do it. I won't remember any of this anyway. And I was told, you will never forget. And as I was standing there with this primordial longing to stay exactly where I was forever, I felt my efforts were futile because I was being drawn out of that ocean of love and mercy, out of that beauty, the majesty, and I was being moved back into my own body. Now, as I was leaving, I looked up at that waterfall and I, the light became more and more brilliant. And I heard a message that said, close your physical eyes. So I closed my eyes and then I could see much more clearly. It was magnificent, truly beautiful. And then I was suddenly gone. Now I was told to close my physical eyes because the light was so bright, it actually felt like it was burning my eyes. Um, even though in that moment I was in pure bliss. Now I'm back in the living room. My boyfriend's sitting there holding my physical body. He has his arm around me and I begin to shake violently. And he holds me and tries to soothe me and says, are you all right? Are you all right? Do you think you need a doctor? And I said, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And, and I opened my eyes and I looked at him and I said, oh my gosh, I have had the most magnificent experience. And he said, wow, what happened to you? And I said, why are you talking like that? Why are you looking at me that way? He goes, you need to go look in the bathroom there. So I get up from the couch with his help. He walks with me to the bathroom mirror and I look in the mirror. And what do I see? My eyes are sunburned. They are bright red. The whites are all red as if I've spent the entire day on the beach without sunglasses. You know what that would be like. And the edges are swollen and red. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Now, I, I realized, okay, I really actually went somewhere. This was not my imagination. And, um, and there really was light and it was extremely powerful. And they told me to close my physical eyes to protect myself, my physical body, but I didn't hear any instructions and I didn't know what to do. And so I said to my boyfriend, I said, I have to go to class. I have to drive to my master's degree class. Now that night, interestingly enough, there was a guest professor. This professor was someone who had traveled to 
um, many of the world's spiritual sites. Now, these weren't always the most popular spiritual sites like we might think to go on a pilgrimage. These were places where the energy vortexes of the world are and where people have had miraculous experiences occur. And I thought this ought to be interesting after what happened in my living room tonight. <laughs> this ought to be really interesting. So I go to the class and I'm sitting there and it's a big class. Maybe there's 100 students and I'm way in the back because I don't want anybody to notice me. And he begins to lecture and he's only about it's a it's a three hour class. And um, he begins to lecture and he's maybe 10 minutes into it and he's looking around the room. And he sees me, I can see that he sees me. So I kind of smile. And he suddenly stopped lecturing. And he said, I want everyone to leave the room and take a 15 minute break. And I'm thinking, gosh, we just got in the class. But everybody starts getting up to go get coffee or whatever they're going to do. And I don't want to get up, I just want to sit quietly and kind of hold on to myself and the energy that I still feel. It's all around me, I can feel it. And the professor comes to me and he stands kind of hovering above me and says, what has happened to you? And I said, why are you asking me that? He said, you've had a spiritual experience, haven't you? And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, what happened? And I said, but how would you know? Why are you asking me now, and he said, you are glowing. He said, you are radiating such an aura. You would not believe the light coming off of you. And he goes, oh my God, and look at your eyes. You've been standing in the presence of the light. And I said, you know, I'm not ready to talk about this. Now, keep in mind, this is me with my little Southern Baptist background. I don't have any idea. Already that writing on the, uh, the blackboard that's been going on um, is happening in the classroom. This is just crazy. And of course, I know I have never heard of a near-death experience. I, have, I don't know anything about the tunnel. I don't know anything about going into the light. And, um, and he smiles at me and he said, I know this is all new for you. He said, but you've had a major transformation. And he said, you should go home. And I said, but I need the credit for my class. I said, I'm an honor student. I can't afford any missed classes. And he said, oh, I'll give you credit for the class. And he said, but you need to go home. You need to rest. You need to protect your energy. And I said, but I was fascinated by what you were talking about. He said, you do not need to hear what I have to say tonight. You need to go home. And I got up picked up my books, got in my car, and I went home. On the way there, an airplane, I went near the airport, an airplane travels over the car, and that's normal. But suddenly I start crying, and I hear an inner message that says, when you hear of the person who appears to be dying, you must fly to them at once. So I realize it's not someone near to me. It's not my boyfriend who's sick or whatever, that somebody far away um, is ill. And at that time, we didn't fly very much back then when, when I was 21 years old. That was an unusual thing. And why I was crying, I didn't know. It was just this flow of energy that was occurring was so intense and magnificent that I could barely contain myself. I literally went home and crawled under the covers and pulled them over my head and slept like that all night. I forgot to set the alarm, but I woke up in plenty of time the next morning. It had been warm that day, it was spring, and I was shocked to discover that overnight it had suddenly turned cold and there was a blanket of snow everywhere. But to me, it felt so pristine and beautiful in the early morning light with all that beautiful white snow. And I thought, I'm going to forget all of this. You know, it's too weird what's happening to me and frightening for me in some ways. And I went to class. Um, I went to school to teach. And I began my first class feeling perfectly fine. 
I hadn't put my hand on the chalkboard yet, so nothing was happening. And almost instantly, the, the principal appeared in my room and he said, you need to come with me. And my students, you know, laugh, ooh, you're in trouble, principal's here. And he said, and you need to bring your purse. And I thought, my purse? And I said, I have class to teach, why am I leaving? And he said, we'll send someone to take your place. And I said, okay, everybody has to be very quiet and you just sit here and wait till I find out what's going on. And I left with the principal. He didn't say anything as we went downstairs and we went into his office and there stood my boyfriend. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I went back to your house and he said, this is a terrible confession to make, but I didn't know what was wrong with you last night and you freaked me out. And he said, so I went back to your apartment to get some of my things that I had left there because I wasn't sure if I wanted to see you again. And, and I said, well, I'm sorry I scared you. And I said, but why are you here? And he said, while I was there, the phone rang. And what you were talking about, the, the person who you thought was dying, it's your sister in New York. Now, I lived in Indiana at the time. And, um, and she lived in New York City and she was a high powered mathematician working in Wall Street doing future thinking about computers that I didn't even know what they were yet. And, but she'd always been brilliant. And, and I said, well, what happened? What do they say? And he said, he said, didn't you um, say you have to go to her? And I said, oh yeah, I have to get on a plane. And he said, well, when your mother called, I found out what the nearest airport was and I have already gotten you a ticket and I packed a suitcase. And I said, oh my gosh, she said, I'm ready to take you to the airport. And I said, I guess I'm gonna get on an airplane and go to my sister. And I said, did you have any news about what's wrong? He said, they have no idea. They just say she's dying. And so I flew to New York, take a cab. I go to the hospital where my mother is waiting. When I see her, I said, hello, but my mother is acting all chipper. And, and I said, mom, aren't you concerned about Debbie? I heard she's dying. And my mother said, but I talked to your boyfriend and he said that she's not dying. And I said, well, yes, that's what I think, but I think we should go see what's going on with her. And um, so we go to her and she's in um, isolation because they don't know what's caused her to go into a coma. And she's in a glassed off room that you're not allowed to go in. And there's a nurse coming out and I approached the nurse and she said, you can't come in. And I put my hand up like this, not in any aggressive fashion, just because I felt I was supposed to put my hand up and the nurse goes flying backwards. And I walk into the room. And I said, I need to be here. I need to see my sister. The other nurse approached me and I said, I need to see my sister. And that nurse goes flying backwards. And my mother puts her head into the room and she said, I think you should do whatever she says to the nurses. And, and I said, I need to see a surgeon immediately, please go get a doctor. And they left and left me with my sister. Now, what was happening was I had already begun to receive this information and I was told to put my hand on my sister's temple and I approached her and put my right hand on her right temple and my sister opened her eyes and came out of the coma and she said, Annie, I had the most terrible headache. And I said, I know, Debbie, it's okay, just rest. I'm here now. Everything's going to be fine. And she said, oh, good. She thought she was dying. I said, you're not. Everything's going to be fine. So I put my hand back on her head again because I was instructed to do so. And I was amazed that I suddenly had x-ray vision. I could see inside my sister's head. Now this was just before the um, CAT scans were created. So they didn't have a way to see everything inside my sister's head. But about that moment, the doctor appears. And I said, if I told you that I could see inside my sister's head, would you believe me? And he said, yes. 
And he took a piece of paper and a pen and he quickly drew a brain with two hemispheres. And he said, can you draw me what you see and point out anything you think is wrong? And I said, I know exactly what's wrong. There's a busted balloon in here. I don't know what that means, but I see it. And I drew it exactly where it was. He said, that would be an aneurysm. If I tell you the names of aneurysms, can you identify which type it is? And I said, yes, tell me what they are. And he identified several types of aneurysms. And one he said was hereditary and had a long name. And I said, that's it, that's the one. He said, if I operate and it's exactly where you say it is, I will be able to save her life, probably. But if it's not, she's going to die anyway. And I suggest we move her straight to surgery. And I said, please do. My mother and I will sign off on that. And we did. My mother was absolutely confident the whole time because my boyfriend had told her that my sister was not dying. So my sister comes through the surgery perfectly. It's exactly what I have identified. And the surgeon is thrilled he was able to save her life. And I met with him and I said, please explain to me why you would listen to me. And he said, now remember, I am, I'm young. I, I'm not even 22 years old yet. And um, he, he listened attentively and followed my instructions. And he said, I've heard of this sort of thing before. And you were the only chance we had. If there were any chance that we were going to save her, you might know, and we didn't know. And he said, so I'm thrilled to have worked with you. And it was wonderful. And so remember in the 10 things, it says that this person will be better off than they were before, although it will not appear to you to be, so, to be so. Now, what happened after that was I stayed for three days and then I went back to Indiana because I had to continue teaching school. And my sister was perfectly fine. She could write, she could speak, she was just fine. But they had removed all the mirrors from her room because the operation was horrendous. Going in, you, back then it was this big, open the entire skull and her, and her head was shaven and she looked like Frankenstein. And the stitches were <clears throat> big to hold everything together. And it, it looked terrible. So they removed the mirrors, but my sister was very beautiful. And she could tell she's bald now. And she's really upset about that because she had long, dark hair that was really gorgeous. And after I leave in the middle of the night, she gets up, leaves her bed, which she's not supposed to do un unaided, goes to another room that's empty, goes into the bathroom and looks in the mirror. She faints falls and hits her head and has a stroke. She becomes paralyzed on one side. She's extremely upset. My mother is too. And my mother says, we're going to have to move her to another facility. And, you know, it's a completely different issue now. She's lost mobility on her left side. And um, my mother has her transferred to what we would call more a nursing home, where they're supposed to very slowly but surely help her get her mobility back. Now, but remember, my sister was a high powered mathematician on Wall Street, and she was having none of this business of a nursing home. So when my mother wasn't around, my sister orders a walker and a cab and um, sets herself up at a major hospital in New York City so she can have some serious rehab instead of this nursing home. And when my mother wasn't around, the cab arrives, Debbie walks out of the place, doesn't tell anybody that she's leaving and checks herself into this high powered New York hospital. And they were able to restore a lot of her mobility. She was able to walk again. She never had full use of her left arm, but you would 
I mean, she was not held back in any way whatsoever. You would never know. But she really did have to scale things down or she was susceptible to another stroke, which they warned her about. But Debbie lived, her life went on, she was happy and she met her husband to be and married and had her son who is my nephew, Joey. And so I was really happy my sister lived. I was sad to see that she was paralyzed on one side, happy to see that she'd regained a lot of mobility. But I understood then that the 10 things were very exacting because to me, it didn't appear that she was better off than she was before. But obviously from my perspective now, my sister had some karma that this had allowed her to burn off and you know, she drove a car. She wouldn't let anybody else drive. She played ping pong. She, she did everything she ever did as if nothing ever happened. And she never seemed to feel sorry for herself. And she had her son and married her husband, Marty. And, you know, it was, it was just exactly as it was meant to be. Now, I want to tell you what happened next to me. Um, I move along here to the point where um, I have married the boyfriend and um, I had been told that I would have a child before I was 30 and it would change my life and years have passed and I have continued to have the handwriting on the wall year after year has gone on. And, um, and I'm about to get married. The, um, what happened at the school was that um, the students, because they were being quickened, wanted in my classroom. They demanded, I want Anne for my classroom teacher. They called me by my last name, of course, but that's what they wanted. They wanted me as their teacher. And, um, and so everybody wanted in my class, but there were lots of English teachers. And so not everybody can be in my class. And, but they clamored to be in my class. So if they had a study hall, they would sign up for a second English class so that they could be in my class. And the school board called me in front of them, had a meeting, special meeting, and said, we don't know what's going on in your classroom, but it's very unusual for everybody to want to take an English class that they don't even have to take. And so we want you to stick with the curriculum and teach things exactly as they should be. Now, I loved my job. Oh my gosh, I loved being a teacher so much. I thought, gosh, I would come here and do this even if they didn't pay me. I would get a job at night just so I could afford to be here during the day. And, and I certainly didn't want them to fire me. So what I want to say is, okay, I'll do that. I'll do whatever you want me to do even if I never have to touch the chalkboard again so my hand doesn't take off and start doing this automatic writing thing. I didn't even know that's what it was called, but my students, I sent them out for extra credit to go to any spiritual events that they could find so they could begin to investigate what was going on in the classroom. And I had learned, they'd come back and said, it's called automatic writing. So I'm in front of the school board and my mouth has a life of its own. And it says, it says, no, it says, no, I will not do it. And I absolutely did not want to say that, but I said, what you don't understand is that you have teachers here who give maybe 30% of themselves. The minute the last class is over, they're gone. And I said, I stay after school. I am tutoring football players. I am working with students from early morning. They come before class, they stay after school. I'm giving you a thousand percent of myself, more than I ever knew that I had to give, a thousand percent at least. So if you understood, you would never let me go. But if you let me go, someone else will want me. Now that was the end of that particular school year. And they had said that if I said yes and would do what they ask, I would be offered a new contract. So I realized that meant they're not going to offer me a new contract. And I went home and cried. And I was like, mouth, why did you do that? Why did you say those things? I wanted to say yes, but it was as if my mouth completely had a life of its own. 
And weeks passed and I was sad and I knew eventually I was going to have to, I was gonna have to try and find another job. I was gonna have to put in my resume and start looking around. But one early morning, the phone rang and it was the principal. He didn't even say, hello, this is Mr. Cobbs or anything. He just said, Anne, what do you want? And I'm like, what do you mean, what do I want? And I said, of course, I want my job. I want a contract. And he said, okay, I, what I want to tell you is you can have whatever you want. I'm like, what do you mean, whatever I want? What are my options? And he said, you can have more money. You can have first crack at federal grants. You can have all the classes that you want, your pick of the classes, only the best ones if you want. You can have whatever you want. And I said, what happened between do exactly what we say or we won't give you a contract and I can have everything I want. I'm missing something. And he said, oh, you haven't heard. And I said, no. He said, the school board son became national merit scholar in science. And I said, well, that's great. What's it got to do with me? He said, Ann, he was a C student. And in his interview for national merit scholar, when he was asked, how did you go from being a C student to being one of the most outstanding science students in the United States? He said, it was my English teacher. Now, fortunately, he didn't say I was quickened <laughs> and he left it at that, but he was the um, president of the school board's son and the school board's president was the one who wanted to let me go. So now he realized he made a big mistake and he wanted to get me back. So I put my list together and I got my job back and it was wonderful. And I loved teaching and I felt like I would have stayed there forever. Uh, but now it's time to marry my boyfriend. And I'd been told I'd have a child before I was 30. I'm 29. I get married. I get pregnant and I have a magnificent childbirth experience. My child is born in the call. That means the bag of waters didn't break. I have natural childbirth at home, just an amazing experience. And, but the marriage was not good. And um, her father is still a dear friend of mine, but um, I, we both knew this, this wasn't gonna last. And, when my daughter was only about, oh yes, three years old, um, her father and I have split and I would drive her to his place and then I would come back. By this time I'm teaching school in Cincinnati and, um, and he lives still in Indiana. So I would drive to Indiana from Ohio and take her to see him and then I would drive there and come back. And I'm driving back one night really late um, he didn't do the laundry the whole time she was with him. So he stuffed all those dirty clothes in a big old military duffel bag that he had from when he was younger. And, um, and we didn't use seat belts back then. So she's sitting in the front seat with that duffel bag in front of her, a really tall duffel bag. And she's using it as a pillow to lean forward on. And I'm driving, it's late at night. There's very few cars on the highway and I'm on some back country road. And all of a sudden I see headlights coming toward me and then they veer off the road. And it looks like the guy is going to crash. It's a truck and it looks like he's gonna crash. But when he hits the embankment off the side of the road, his car veers and comes back on the road. And then, it's as if he's fallen asleep at the wheel and he's pressing down on the gas pedal because he's going faster and faster and suddenly he swerves and he's coming right at me. Hits me full on going over 60 miles an hour at close range and um, takes the entire top off the top of my car. The whole roof goes flying off my car. The impact was so hard. My daughter is leaning on that duffel bag is like a missile thrown right into the duffel bag. All around her, the car is crumpled, glasses everywhere. And 
my seat broke and I'm lying down flat. My back is broken in several places. I'm cut everywhere. My head is cut open. My ear is cut off. It's just an absolute disaster. And suddenly I'm out of my body again. I'm having a near death experience. I don't know to call it that. And I'm away from the accident, flying among the trees. And my first response is, oh, thank God, because I recognize the experience of being out of my body again and that I am free again. And I feel the bliss and the joy and the freedom and the excitement. And to me, because that body is in such bad shape, perhaps dead, um, it means I don't have to go back. Ha, I'm at last free, yay. So I'm celebrating up there in the trees and I'm flying around and I'm joyous. And I lo I'm looking over the scene and I see that they're taking the driver away. And I can tell that he's a drunk driver because you can smell alcohol over the whole scene, like whiskey smell everywhere. And um, they put him in an ambulance and they take him away. And I thought, that's interesting. They took away the drunk driver, but they left my body just lying there. And I'm looking down at it and I'm thinking, oh, it must be dead. Because what I see next is a hearse arrives. That's for me. And they came to get my body and they come with a blowtorch. Now, they would normally use the jaws of life if you're alive, but if you're not alive, they use a blowtorch to cut the metal off because you remember the whole top of the car has collapsed on top of me and they're gonna have to cut me out. And so he's approaching with the blowtorch and I'm like, he shouldn't burn my body like that. And then I hear this voice and it's my daughter and she's, crying and she says my mommy bleed my mommy bleed and someone has come and rescued her now I later find out that behind us the car closest to us that stopped for the accident the woman in the car was a kindergarten teacher so she has my daughter and she's sweet talking her but my daughter is crying my mommy bleed my mommy bleed and she's saying, oh, your mommy will be fine. And I'm thinking, nope, I'm not going to be fine because I'm not going back in that body. But then I'm thinking, I can't just leave her like this. What am I thinking? I'm not free. I have a child. I have to go back. And I'm looking at the body and the blowtorch is approaching. And I am like, oh, my gosh, I am going to have to get back in that body. And it's sort of like, holding your nose to dive in water. It was like, oh, I have to do everything I can to force myself to get back into that body. But I go in, I go in, I'm in. But the pain is horrific. And I suddenly feel all the pain. Previously, I didn't feel any pain. I felt like I was, you know, a teenager and free and happy and and I pop right out of my body. I can't stay in there. <clears throat> Pain forces me out. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to do it again. <laughs> I'm going to have to get back in that body. I'm going to have to get in there and stay in there. Blow torches getting closer. And here I go, like diving into ice cold water. Oh, force against force. I don't want to go. And yet I know I have to. I dive back in the body. I feel the pain and this time I'm like, okay, okay, you can do it, you can do it, but it's awful. I feel myself vomiting in my own mouth. I can't see, my eyes are filled with glass. My tongue is full of glass, I can't speak. I am cut all over my body and my back is broken. The pain is terrible. My head is throbbing like a son of a gun and there's blood everywhere and I can taste this nasty acrid blood taste in my mouth and I hear the man with the blowtorch saying honey if you're alive in there just give us a sign and I realized that one of my hands was still clinging to where the wheel should be and it's up in the air and I can move my little finger and I move my little finger 
and I hear the man cry out, oh my God, she's alive. And you can hear that sound of the torch, stop. And he starts sobbing saying, oh my God, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. We will get you out of here. And he starts yelling to the um, first, um, the paramedics that I'm alive and that he needs help. And while that's happening, I will tell you that I took a quick dip out of my body, sat up in the trees and watched as they got my body out of there. But every now and then I would pop back in because he kept checking my pulse. And I would see, oh, get back in, get back in, check pulse. I'm alive. Okay, fine. And then I am horrified that they put me in the hearse to take me to the hospital because that's all they've got. They took the ambulance already. I have to go with the hearse. They don't want to wait for another ambulance to arrive. And I'm in a small country area where they probably only have one ambulance. Um, the next thing I know, I'm on the operating table and it it is a horrible, horrible experience. They have my tongue in some device that looks like a medieval torture device because they pull my tongue way out because it's it's full of glass. The glass has penetrated my tongue and they are pulling the glass out of my tongue. It's just the most God awful feeling. And my eyes are filled with glass. So they have my eyes open like that with a device and they're very carefully pulling little splinters of glass out of my eyes. Back then glass didn't shatter like it does today. It broke exactly as it did. And for this reason, they changed glass, I'm sure, so that it doesn't break like that. Because of my spiritual studies and the things that I was learning, I had discovered that we can change our vibration and rise above certain situations. And in doing that, we can actually change the situation. And I knew in this moment that I had to, because I heard the nurse yelling, we're losing her, we're losing her, her blood pressure is dropping. So they're doing whatever they do, but I know that there's an ancient name for God. It's spelled H-U and pronounced Hugh. And I began to think, Hugh, Hugh, but I can't speak. And the next thing that happens is they finished with my tongue and they let it loose. And so now I'm hewing in the room and the doctor hears me and he said, what is that? And I said, Hugh. And he said, Hugh, and repeats it back to me. And I said, yes. And the nurse yells, okay, okay, okay. It's working, whatever that is, keep doing it. And the doctor says, everybody sing this word. And they're chanting the word that I am singing to the point that I don't even have to chant it anymore. Now, the marvelous thing, the thing I did not expect, my blood pressure stabilized, but I feel no pain. Now, because of the head injury, they can't give me any pain medicine and they are stitching up my head and putting it back together from here to where's my ear, here, I, my head is cut open, my ear is cut off, they're putting my ear back on, they're stitching my head, and I feel no pain. In fact, I'm talking to the surgeon while the nurses and the assistant surgeon are singing the word Hugh. They're just chanting away. They have no idea what they're doing, but they're changing my vibration and changing the room. So they finish all of this. I'm perfectly stable now. They get me in a room, I go to sleep. My they found out my husband's name, my daughter told them, my ex-husband now, and he's arrived at the hospital and taken my daughter. So I wake up in the hospital the next day, and there are three doctors and three nurses standing around me. And I said, well, good morning. And they said, oh, you did great. And I said, yes, thank you. And I said, gosh, I'm so grateful. That was terrible. And they said, well, you may wonder why we're all here. And I said, 
well, you're checking on me, aren't you, <laughs> to see how I'm doing? And they said, well, we want to know what happened last night. And I said, oh, you want to know about the hue. You want to understand about that chant that you did. And they said, yes. And I said, actually, in my purse, there's a book. And, um, and I referred them to a book called Ekankar Key to Secret Worlds. And I said, in that book, you will learn about how to chant Hugh. It's helped me tremendously. And, um, and so they said, do you have any other books? And I'm like, no, that's just book I was reading, but you can take it and you can all have it and you can share it. And they happily went away. I'm released a couple of days later, my friend comes to get me. And I realized that the, um, the drunk driver lived and he's just down the hall from me. They don't want me to know where he is because they're afraid that I will be angry and vindictive and mean to him, but I'm grateful that he lived. I mean, obviously he needed help. And it turns out he had three little children. He really needed help. And this was not his first drunk driving offense, but I, I only want to say, I'm glad we both made it. We made it through that because it looked terrible. And to me now I, still had no word for a near-death experience. And I want you to understand about IONS and why I appreciate an organization like this and Spiritual Awakenings International. I appreciate that organization tremendously. Why is because when I went to the IONS convention, the national meeting that um, they were holding the very first time, I had been asked to speak by someone who heard me speaking about the sort of things that you're hearing here. And um, I still didn't even know what IONS meant. And they were speaking about near death experiences. And I realized, oh, that's what I had. That's what they're talking about. And I didn't understand certain things. Once I came back from that second near death experience, um, I had trouble going into places where there were electronics, like things are plugged into the walls, like, um, like Best Buy or that sort of thing where people will go pick out their electronic equipment because the equipment around me would misbehave. And I couldn't wear a watch because my watch would actually run backwards. It wouldn't run correctly. And, and I had no idea that it was because of having been in the inner worlds that it changes the vibration and changes the frequency. But I began to understand, and I had promised that today I would also share another of those vibrational stories because this is what happened just in the middle of what was happening in my classroom and after the experience with my sister. I was still teaching high school and I knew that I was going to have to have this divorce. I was going through some issues and I went down to visit my mother for Christmas. This is before my daughter is born. And um, I had no idea I was going to get pregnant and, and have this child because I'd been told I could never have a child. So this is what happens in between. Um, and it's a vibrational experience, but again, a spiritual awakening of huge proportion for me. So I go to this island where my mother lives, Hilton Head Island, and I've been going through so much. I can hardly keep up with it all. I don't understand it. I'm reading everything. I'm studying Buddhism. I'm taking comparative world religions. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to try and understand what's going on in my own life. And, um, and this day, this beautiful Christmas day, it's over 80 degrees. The ocean at that time of year in the Atlantic is cold, even in South Carolina, maybe down in Miami, it's warm enough to swim, but usually not in Hilton Head. Um, but I don't care. I love the ocean and I am intent that I am going to go swimming. And so I, um, I go to the beach after opening presents with my mom, I go to the beach and I decide I'm just going to dive in and start swimming as hard and fast as I can and let the ocean just clear my head and clear my energy. And, and I began to swim. 
But what happens is unbeknownst to me, I have just gone right into the ocean where there's a riptide. There's nobody else in the ocean. There are no lifeguards and I am being pulled way out to sea, but I have no idea of that. I'm just swimming away hard and fast as I can. And when I finally tire and I look up, I'm like, oh my God, look how far I am from the beach. Now, I grew up around the coast and I knew that there was one rule on Hilton Head. You never, ever go where the shrimp boats are. Now, the reason you don't is because sharks come to feed with the leftovers around the shrimp boats. They come and clean up, they get whatever they can, they scavenge. And so you don't wanna be out where the sharks are. And I'm looking and I'm like, well, look, there aren't any shrimp boats, so I should be okay. But then I realize, oh, there aren't any shrimp boats because it's Christmas day and nobody probably told the shark. So I better get out of here really quickly because I am probably at about where the shrimp boats would be. And I'm trying to decide how to get out of the riptide. You have to swim laterally. So do I want to swim to the right or to the left? I, I can't really tell any orientation because I'm so far from the beach, but I look to my left and it's like, oh my God, my mother is going to hate this because there's a shark coming right at me and her daughter is gonna get eaten on Christmas day. And I can see the headline of the local newspaper and it is going to be bad. And I ask inwardly because now I have learned to follow inner guidance and I say, what do I need to do? I am thinking there's a way to fight a shark. Maybe you poke it in the snout or poke it in its eyes or do something. I'm willing to fight back. There's absolutely nobody can rescue me. And I get this inner message to lie down flat, long and lean. And I thought it's going to eat me like a French fry. It'll be here any second. Lie down long and lean and turn away. And I turned my head away and I lay down flat in, in the ocean, floating, bobbing on the surface. And suddenly I am hit from underneath so hard that I expect to be pulled under. And instead I find myself lifted up as if I'm levitating above the surface of the ocean. At, but I'm also flying through the air somehow toward the beach and my heart is pounding. I'm scared to death of the shark. I don't know where he is. I don't know why I'm flying. The riptide has me out so far and I have no idea what's happening. And whatever I'm on, my flying carpet, I begin to fall off and suddenly I'm hit again from underneath, but I'm lifted up instead of being pulled down. And then all of a sudden, in front of me, I see this magnificent dolphin. And then I see another and another. And I realize it's a school of dolphins and they have come to rescue me. And that I am on the back of a dolphin. And because I'm not holding on to the dorsal fin, as I fall off, another one comes underneath and picks me up. And they just keep swooping me up until they have me in chest deep water. Now here, they could have left me. They could have just left me. I'm rescued. I'm grateful. I'm saying, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful. I love dolphins. This is beyond imagination. Now I realize why I was told to lie down long and lean because I needed to make myself into a platform for the dolphin to be able to lift me up the first one and then the next and then the next. and. Suddenly I understood that there is an interconnectedness with all life that is so far beyond my normal imagination, my normal awareness that I think most people are not aware. And I certainly wasn't, but the dolphins heard my cry. They answered the call. They came just like that to rescue me. I never even saw the shark again. I would like to believe there wasn't even a shark. But what happens next is the dolphins surround me. And they do this beautiful musical choreographed number going, 
be going round and around me. And after a while of doing that, they do this dance and then still not leaving me, they began to take turns one by one, touching different parts of my body. So one lovingly touches my shoulder, one moves across my back, one against my legs, one across my heart. And I am just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I realize what's happening. They are changing my vibration. It is no different than when I've had the out of body experiences and gone into the inner worlds. They, they are literally doing that again, where you come back and you're completely different. You are transformed. You are transformed. And that's what was happening to me. They were changing me on a molecular level and I knew it. And I said it to them, oh my God, you're changing me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I welcomed them to do it. And they did that, whatever it was they were doing. Then they surround me again. They do their beautiful choreographed dance. Then they divide into pairs and they leave like this, facing me, but on their tail fins. And then finally, they go off in twos and off they go. And on the beach, I hear all this applause because people, of course, it's Christmas Day. So people are all over the beach and they've been picking up sand dollars and walking along until they saw the dolphins. And so now they've all congregated right where I am going to be coming out of the water. And I began to move out of the water, coming toward the beach. And this one woman says, oh my gosh, do you work with the dolphins? <laughs> and I said, no, I got pulled out by a riptide and they rescued me. But an old man stepped forward immediately and he said, those dolphins saved your life. And I nod, yes, I know they did. And he said, I saw that shark coming for you. He's got his little binoculars on. He's been picking up shells and watching what was going on. And he said, I thought you were about to be eaten. And I'm like, oh gosh, don't say it again. I thought the same thing. And now people want to talk to me and ask me questions. And what was interesting was, once again, my body, my physical body begins to shake all over and I can't stay. I, I just take a few moments to dry myself off and I go home to my mother. And when I get there, I pass my mom sitting in the living room, reading the paper. And she said, how was the beach? And I say, it was incredible. And I don't even tell her what happened. I go straight to my bed, exactly like before and pull the covers over my head. And you know, sometimes it is that way when we've had these spiritually transformative experiences, it's hard to integrate it. It's hard to go back out into the world and not sound like a screaming lunatic. Oh my God, you won't believe the world is so incredible. There's an interconnectedness to all life and molecularly you can be changed and there's vibration. And so I'm quiet instead. <laughs> And I just hide. And later at dinner, when my mother says, well, what happened at the beach today? You sure were exhausted. And I told her what happened. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. And then when I went home, I went back to teaching back to Indiana. My mother sent me a clipping from the paper called the Island Packet, the South Carolina Hilton Head newspaper, Island Packet. And there's a photograph. And it says these dolphins came and played with the children and people suspected that there were sharks out there and that the dolphins were moving the children toward the beach. And mom said, a little note on the side said, I think these are your dolphins <laughs> that you told me about. And I said, yeah, I think so too. I later learned that the dolphins on Hilton Head, unlike the dolphins normally around the world, don't migrate. They stay right where they are. This is home. They love that place and that's where they stay. So every time I go to Hilton Head and every time since then, I feel like these are my dolphins or the descendants of my dolphins. And I feel like it's a really special and very magical place. For me, it was just incredible. And 
you know, fortunately, I can say that ends the near death sagas that I have had. But after a while, we recognize that these are not accidents. We think we have accidents, but they are not accidents. That we, we think that it's some big horrific event like the car wreck, but it wasn't a big horrific event at all. Even though I did have to recover, even though my back was broken, even though I was bleeding internally and badly injured, I recovered incredibly well and went on to other extremely magnificent and mystical experiences. And it's as if none of that really matters because this is what we signed up for. Remember that experience that I read to you with the 10 things. It says, oh, I took my, I took my little marker out, but I found it. Remember, everything is always happening exactly as it should whether it appears that way to us or not. And so my healing was magnificent. Because of that, I have learned so many things. Um, I discovered energy medicine as a way to help us to change our bodies. Um, when I had my daughter um, after this experience, um, she was born as I said, what's called in the Bible of being born in the call. It meant she was born and carried through the birth canal in the bag of waters and the water never broke. And it is a sign, according to the Bible, that you're blessed by God and that you will have prophecies and that you will be prophetic and you will have spiritual qualities. And my daughter, Sarah, is exactly that way. When she was a child, she could look at someone and begin to prophesy their life. In fact, I had to encourage her not to do that because I was like, Sarah, not everybody wants to know what's going to happen to them. She would look at one of my girlfriends and say, oh, the man you love, he doesn't love you back. And you think he's going to ask you to marry him, but he's not. And they would get really mad. <laughs> and I would say, honey, they don't want, they don't need to know the future. But then there were people who learned that she could do this and they began to seek her out. And she was as young as three and four years old. And one of my friends came and took her to the park, but didn't bring her back all day. And I was very frightened. And, and I begged her, please stop telling them their futures because they're, they're trying to use you to know what they themselves should try and discover and you're too little. And so she suppressed that ability somewhat, but she's remained amazing. And um, she's gone on to do a lot of energy medicine work herself and be trained in that field. Um, and she has a little site, um, lightwavedevice.com and um, we continue to use energy medicine constantly because it was one of the major things that I learned. Um, obviously I had a lot of healing to do, but today I have absolutely no ill effects of anything that happened. And I'm grateful both to God and to energy medicine and learning that we can alter our energy and that by doing so, we can move ourselves to a frequency that protects us, that makes things uh, work better. And now I want, to, I want to tell you what happened with my sister, my sister Debbie, whose life I helped save by having this near-death experience and going into the inner worlds and learning that I had to come back and follow all instructions as they were given. And she recovered and she stayed quite the mathematician and had a good life. And, and then one day, about a little over 10 years later, I got a call from my sister. She now lived in Atlanta. She had a more low key job working with a big bank. And um, she was out of New York City and out of Wall Street and all that pressure because it wasn't good for her brain. And um, I got a call from her and she said, Annie, 
I don't feel well and it's not good. I'm going to the hospital and you need to come to me. And so I went down to Atlanta with my husband um, to see how my sister was and she was already in surgery. It was more aneurysms. And um, this time it was more than one. And she didn't come out of surgery very well this time. Um, she began to speak in math mostly. And we realized that was not a good sign. And, um, and sometimes she would come out of it and she would speak to me. And I stayed with her night and day. I never left the room. And for 21 days, we dealt with that. Um, with the surgeon quite nervous what was going to happen this way or that. And one day he came to me and he was in near tears. And he was a big man. And I said, what is it? What's the matter? And I said, I'm right here with Debbie. And he said, I need you to speak with me privately. So I left Debbie's room and I said, what is it? And he said, we got the test back and they don't look good. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. So sorry to hear that. And he said, but I have something to ask you. He said, were you there when your sister had her first aneurysm? And I said, yes, I was in New York. And he said, oh my God. He said, you wanna know why I'm crying? I just realized who your sister is. And I realized who you are. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? I'd never met this man before. And he said, the surgeon who operated on your sister in New York was my roommate. He said, we'd been college roommates and then as young doctors, we were roommates. And he came home and he told me all about you. And now here I am, not in New York, I'm in Atlanta and it's your sister again and you're here again. And I'm not doing well, I'm losing her. And I'm thinking, whoa, what an amazing event to ha have the, the surgeon who knew all about me from that time. And he said, I feel like I've waited my entire adult life to meet you, but can you help me too? Can you help me to save your sister? And I said, oh, I want you to understand it was not me. And I said, it's the divine presence. It's the hand of God. I simply was following all instructions as I was given. And I said, and the only instructions I'm being given now are to stay by my sister's side. And that's what I'm doing. And he said, I'm grateful you're here. I'm grateful I finally met you. And he said, so that is what you're saying. That's what happened that day. And I said, yes. And I said, I had a spiritual experience. I told him about the spiritual experience and being taken out of my body, pulled through that dark tunnel, this little black hole in my room, in the living room, and taken into the ocean of love and mercy and told that this was the illusion of death. And I gave him the most important lesson of all, that there is no death that we are all great spiritual beings and we live on forever and life is more magnificent and interconnected than most of us could ever imagine. And, you know, I know there's a lot of questions that are piling up here and um, I do want to have a chance to tell you a little bit about, it's not even published yet. We didn't even send it to the publisher or a publisher yet. Um, but the new book is called Five Blue Rings, and the website is fiveblueRings.com or .org. And um, it does not mention when the book is being published, um, but soon we'll have an answer for you. The last editor who is reading it um, is getting her feedback to us, but um, when you understand the story, you'll know why we waited. We knew that there was a very precise timing on the planet when that book needed to come out. And we've been following all instructions as they're given. And sometimes it may look like we're dragging our feet, but in fact, this looks like the time that this book is ready to come out in the world. And the story, of course, if you want to hear the story, it is recorded at spiritualawakeningsinternational.org. 
and you can go and hear it. Mine is one of the latest interviews that's listed there, the one hour version of the story, which is a pretty short version. But I wanted to tell you just a little tiny bit about that story. In it, I have a spiritual experience with the light again and the sound, but this time a shared spiritual experience with my husband, my husband now of 36 years plus, um, it has been a magnificent, magnificent marriage and um, divinely inspired, brought together spiritually. And that story with the light tells me that there is so much going on on the planet and it makes the work that you're doing, um, Diane Willis, the work that you're doing with IONS in Chicago and IONS internationally and Spiritual Awakenings International, it makes that work so important because more and more people are having um, spiritually transformative experiences of all kinds, near-death experiences. And believe me, it's not because we're clumsy uh, that we're having these experiences. We're having them because people need to share more. We need to tell our stories. And Diane, you give people an opportunity to do that, to share their stories so that others may listen, so that others may learn and grow and be aware of their experiences, just as I was completely unaware of my experience at the time when I had it. I had no idea what was happening, and I had no idea that other people had those experiences. And so how beautiful and blessed it is that you make this opportunity available for people. Um, I see someone is saying, that's Clara, that you logged on to fiveblueRings.org. Um, I will notify people when the book is being published and let you know how to purchase it, but I don't know that answer yet because we're not through the last edit. Um, my husband had let me write the story all by myself because the first part is very much involved in what I experienced. I'm on a ship and um, I'm with another man and this man wanted to take this adventure and um, it begins there. And I had written the entire story and um, it felt like because the story is really about my husband and me and how we end up coming together through that whole experience that we needed his voice to be present too. In fact, one of the agents who looked at the book caught, said my husband Alden is her hero because he's so magnificent in this story, but his voice was actually not heard. So we most recently this last year spent time with him writing the opening to every single chapter. So you hear his voice Voice, you hear his perspective of everything that's happening. And I think it's making the story much, much better. That's one of the reasons it's not out. But years ago, before I had written one word, I had been in, um, I had been in San Francisco telling the dolphin story on a big stage before thousands of people. And someone from Hollywood happened to be there since it was in California. And he happened to be sitting next to someone who knew me and knew me well. And so this man from Hollywood said, wow, I'd really like her to get to Hollywood to pitch that story about the dolphins. And he said, you think the dolphin story is a big deal? Wait till you hear the story called Five Blue Rings. You ought to get in touch with you, her. I'll give her your number. You get her to come to Hollywood and share the story of Five Blue Rings. So I went to Hollywood and I shared that story. And I shared it with him. And he said, well, there's a big party in the industry this weekend. And I'd like to tell some people about your story if I have your permission to do so. And I said, of course. But I, I had told my husband, I was there for my daughter's 21st birthday. And um, I said, I, I would only be gone four days. And I called him and I said, listen, I'm, I'm being asked to come to a Hollywood studio to pitch Five Blue Rings. And he said, oh, we'll stay if you need to. 30 days later, I had pitched to all the major studios in Hollywood and Paramount Pictures was the one that eventually picked up the story. I had met the owner of Paramount and um, she loved the story and they made us an offer. They made my husband and I an offer. And they said they would help us get the book written. They would turn it into a New York Times bestseller for sure. They would make sure the world knew about the story and that they would 
make sure that it was a blockbuster film. And it was like, okay, great, yay, just ex exactly what we would want, how perfect. And the producer then said, but Anne, you're not gonna like the offer. And I was like, what's not to like? I mean, is it money? Is that your problem? I mean, is that what you're saying? And he said, no, it's much more serious than that. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, Paramount says that if they release this story as true, they believe that it would create a huge paradigm shift on the planet. And they're not willing to accept responsibility for that. And I'm like, what do they want to do? And he said, they want to say that the story is fiction. And you will have to swear that it's fiction and you will have to sign documents saying that there is no truth to the story whatsoever, legal documents and agree in perpetuity to, to affirm if ever asked that it's fiction, that it's just a story that you made up. You know, my heart was broken because boy, did, did I want that deal? <laughs> I wanted that deal, but I knew I couldn't do it. And, and I said to him, I won't be able to do it. I can't. And I said, the, you know, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm in this life, the reason I'm having these experiences, I believe, is because we need to tell the truth. Remember, my story began with me saying, dear God, teach me truth so that I may teach truth. How can I lie and live like that the rest of my life? And he said, well, I think you should discuss it with your husband. And I said, my husband is worse than I am. He won't live with a lie for a millisecond. He won't put up with it. And I said, for no amount of money, for no reasons, it will not happen. We can't do it. I'll talk to him if you want, but I can tell you what's going to happen right now. And it makes me sad. It breaks my heart. And he said, you know, Anne." He said, I actually feel that the timing isn't right. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the technology isn't even there for this story yet. And it's changing every day in Hollywood. It's getting more and more sophisticated, more and more technologically savvy. And he said, but more than that, and he used a word that I really understood now. He said, the consciousness on the planet is changing. Just give it a while, give it a decade, give it two. I said, two decades, gosh, I may not even be alive. He goes, no, you'll be alive. He said, you will be alive. And when that time comes, you'll know that it's time to bring the story into the world. And so it's been, folks, two decades. And we have been waiting and working on the story and bringing it out first verbally, so now you know at spiritualawakeningsinternational.org, you can hear the story, so you don't actually have to wait. And, um, and in writing, we hope to find a publisher this year and get our final edit done and, um, and announce on our page when Five Blue Rings will be out. But we do change that site from time to time. And so you'll see new things there, new pictures, new stories. And recently there was, um, there was a great story on, NBC, CBS, it was on CBS. There was a great story about the ship that's in the story. They did it um, about the ship was refurbished. It was an old cruise liner from Germany when I was on the ship. And in the story, you'll learn that I actually end up steering this huge ship. And uh, that too was a mystical spiritual experience. And um, it was found by a gentleman named Christopher Wilson on um, eBay and he bought the ship and he's refurbished it and it's now called the Aurora. So you can read all about the Aurora. The ship has a very colorful history. It was in a James Bond film and, um, and it's, been, um, it's been on television, it's been in movies and now it's been rescued and on television again as the Aurora. I knew it as the x -Bex, but I, I definitely invite you to stay in touch with me on fiveblueRings.org. And um, someone's asking me, what is the name of the book 
about chanting that was in your purse. And again, that's Ekankar Key to Secret Worlds. That's where you can learn about the hue, that chant. You can also learn it, learn about it at, I believe, miraclesinyourlife.org. And um, Hugh Ancient Chant. Dot com Hugh, H -U, ancient chant dot com so that answers that question um, and um, are there any other questions could I please write the 10 things or speak them more slowly okay since we have a few more minutes I will um, I'll go over the 10 things again thank you for asking sorry if I was too speedy here we go. So here I am standing in the ocean of love and mercy. I've come to know it, but they called it mercy and love, ocean of mercy and love. And I'll read to you just a little bit of my notes from there. Um, even though I knew that life is about so much more than our own self-awareness and gratification, I didn't wanna be disturbed in my experience. I didn't want to return. I didn't care in that moment about service. I wanted to simply stay here and experience the bliss. But I was told you must return for there is much to do. And then I heard these directives, 10 of them. The delivery was precise and intense. I both felt and heard the message going through me. Number one, Although you have absolutely no intellectual knowledge of what is occurring here, someone very close to you appears to be dying. So again, although you have absolutely no intellectual knowledge of what is occurring here, someone very close to you appears to be dying. Now that's why I call this a shared near-death experience. I felt the presence of someone dying. This was their near-death experience, but somehow I got pulled into my sister's experience and told exactly what I would need to do in order to help her. But it's not just the instructions that I would be given. And Diane, I know that this is what IONS in Chicago is really all about, helping people understand this, that by going into the light, by going into the inner worlds, I was being changed vibrationally so that I could follow the instructions as they were given. So we are changed by the spiritual experiences that we have. Now, I mentioned that chant, Hugh, because by chanting that every day, it allows me to help keep my vibration at a very high level. And, um, and so that was one of the things that I really wanted to share with people, because I knew that the person I was before this experience would not have been able to do what needed to be done in order to have these experiences. Number two, in truth, there is no death only the illusion of death. There is no death, only the illusion of death. Then three, however, upon learning of this apparent death, you must go at once to this person. Then number four, in order to help this person, you will be instructed and must follow all these instructions. Number five, you must tell everyone, this is not death. Number six, after this experience, this person will be better off than ever before. Now, I did tell that surgeon, my sister is not going to die. You're going to be able to do this operation. I've been told this is not death. That's why my mother was so happy, because she believed me that this was not death, even though it definitely looked like it. My sister was absolutely white, pale, had been in a coma since she had fallen in the middle of the street in Manhattan, and no one knew what was wrong with her. She had had a major aneurysm. Number six. 
after this experience, this person will be better off than ever before. Number seven, however, it will not appear to you to be so. Number eight, you must leave here when you are told, although you will not wish to go. Number nine, you have much to do. You must return. You must listen carefully and do as you are instructed. And I believe that's a message for all of us. When we listen carefully to our inner guidance, this is a message for each of us. You must listen carefully and do as you are instructed. And then finally, 10, remember, everything is always happening exactly as it should, whether it appears that way or not. And so there is a bigger plan to life going on than most of us realize. And it's very important that we keep that attitude that everything is happening exactly as it should, even if we don't realize that. And I see there are some other messages here. I appreciate you in, um, in the chant. I mean, in the chat, excuse me. Um, oh, they said I was going too fast again. <laughs> I tell you what, um, I will put these up on the Five Blue Ring site um, within a week or so. Um, I will do that, okay? And then you will be able to find them. And I think I think people will appreciate that. Um, because everybody's trying to capture those 10 things. Now, one of the things that I said um, here is that um, it's when we're having spiritual experiences and sometimes these are not nearly as dramatic as mine, but they are still as transforming to people. It doesn't have to be remarkable transforming experiences. A spiritual experience can change you even more than I was changed. Even if it just happens sitting in your bed while you're chanting a word or doing a spiritual exercise or taking a walk um, in a meadow or on the beach, you can have major spiritual experiences. But um, there, oh, I know where I'll put, I know where I'll put the 10 things. I'll put the 10 things on Facebook for Five Blue Rings. Five Blue Rings is also on Facebook and that way I can post it immediately today. That will work, okay? So hopefully that'll make everybody happy. Um, and um, I also wanted to uh, ask if there's any other questions, if anybody has anything you'd like to ask about any of those experiences, I'd be happy to actually answer questions. So I suppose if you have them, they'll be in the chat. One of the things that um, I could also tell you about is that um, when you use the chant that I used, Hugh, and it isn't particular to me, people have been singing this um, throughout the world, throughout time. It's an ancient chant. Um, it can expand your awareness. It can soothe your heart. It can give you insights. But one of the things that I found is very important is that when you're chanting this word or any word, because you may have a chant that you prefer and that's fine, that the way the inner worlds work is we have to ask for what we want. We have to ask. And so when I ask, teach me truth so that I may teach truth, I was asking, I was opening my heart to that. And so whatever it is that you want to know or learn, don't think that it isn't a worthy enough goal to even bother asking, ask whatever is in your heart and you'll receive your answers. But we have to ask, we have to be open because we are meant to be co-workers with the divine. That's what we're meant to do and be. And and, and so when we ask, when we open our hearts and we ask, we've now indicated our openness and the doors will be thrown open. For me, the experience in the classroom was absolutely magnificent. 
I may not have made it clear, but that experience went on for five years. I am still close to some of my high school students because it went on for five years. In fact, I was giving a talk in Texas years back, maybe five years ago now, and a young woman was sitting in the front row and she was crying. And, um, and I thought, you know, the story I'm telling isn't sad. I don't know why that young girl is crying. She, you know, she wasn't that young, maybe, I don't know, six or seven years younger than me, but um, she looked so sweet. And I thought I have to meet her, but there were hundreds of people in the room and I didn't know if I'd connect with her. And after my talk, I looked around for her. She had long hair and I saw her and she was getting in line to talk to me. And, um, and once she got close to me, I thought I recognized her from somewhere, but I couldn't tell. And she said to me, do you remember me? And I said, where did we meet before? And she said, Avon, Indiana. And I said, oh my gosh, you were one of my students, weren't you? And she said, actually, she said, you changed my life. And I said, how so? And she said, well, she said, I was dyslexic and nobody knew what dyslexia was back then, but you spent enough time with me twisting the book this way and that till you helped me figure out how I could read so that I could get through high school and pass my test. And you worked with me every day and you told me that I was an artist and that I should follow art. And I learned to dance and I became a dancer and I've danced all over the world. And, and I was so happy for her. And I said, so um, I previously wrote a book and um, I asked her, did she have the book? And she said, yes. And, and I said, is that how you came to be at this event? And she said, no. And she said, I didn't even know that book was by you. I knew everybody was talking about you, but I didn't know who you were because your last name has changed and I hadn't seen a picture. And she said, I hadn't even looked on the back of the book. And then when I re when everyone was saying you were coming here to speak, she said, I, I wondered who they were talking about. And somebody showed me your picture because there was a poster. And I was like, that's my high school teacher. That's who that is. <laughs> and and so I saw that, you know, as we go along in life, as we share our stories, as we open ourselves to experience, we can help transform the lives of others just by being a vehicle of love. The, the entire premise of Five Blue Rings, when you hear that story or ultimately read the book, I hope, um, is about the fact that love is the greatest force in the entire universe. Not love as we normally think of it, but love in, in a way that we might think of service. Love is about being there for all life, caring for all life, being open to be of service in any way you can. Like Diane Willis, I love what you do with I in Chicago. I just love it. You've done such a wonderful job. It's an amazing service that you've done. I know you used to meet in this beautiful facility and COVID kind of interrupted that, but it was one of the most magnificent um, presentations I had ever been to with the most diverse audience. So I congratulate you on the service that you do. And as you know, you've heard that I serve on the board of Spiritual Awakenings International, and what a service that is. Um, it, it is just the most beautiful organization. I'm just so glad that it exists because people like me who don't actually understand the spiritual experiences that they're having stumble upon this and and people from so many countries all over the world, more and more countries, 75 countries in, in just Spiritual Awakenings International. I have no idea how many for IONS, Diane, but you know, near-death experiences are happening everywhere. And as I mentioned earlier, people all over the world are having spiritual experiences. I was on another podcast recently 
um, regarding um, synchronicity and people who are having these experiences of synchronicity where something happens kind of like the doctor story where one doctor who's there and has this amazing experience with me in New York and his roommate hears all about it. And years later, here I'm standing with the roommate now instructing him and sharing him the same. They both knew the story of going through the dark tunnel in my living room at little dots in the middle of my living room and standing there and having this shared near death experience, that synchronicity. People are having synchronicities all over the world. Things are happening. Things are shifting. It's like the producer from Paramount said, the consciousness is changing. Our planet is experiencing a quickening. And I know that it doesn't look pretty, but I want to explain because this, the physical universe is a world of duality. We have hot, we have cold, we have night, we have day. And yet, it's all one end of the same spectrum. It appears we have love and we have hate, but we don't. We simply have love on a scale. We, it's all love. It's just, you don't experience it much on the hate end. You experience it a lot here. And love is the most powerful force in the universe. You know, I told you that um, I really got into energy medicine because I realized healing really is about changing the vibration. And, um, oh, someone says, I don't go to, I don't use Facebook. So please put those 10 things on fiveblueRings.org. So I will try and do that for you. Um, and someone says, where are the energy vortexes in the world that you spoke of? The ones not touristy and well-known that your teacher um, traveled to, I don't know to name them. Now, remember, I didn't even stay for the class. So later I heard about it secondhand from other people to prepare for the test, but I didn't, I didn't even get to hear about those. I, I'm as curious as you actually. Um, one of them I know was in Sedona, Arizona. That's the only one that I actually know of where I have stood there and experienced it. But there are places where I have had major experiences. And for me, one for me where my vibration is enhanced tremendously is Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, where I was rescued by the dolphins. So one of the things I wanted to tell you is this powerful force of love. I wanted to explain this. Um, my husband, my precious husband, who had this great experience of five blue rings with me, was diagnosed about four years ago with um, uh, a rapidly advancing melanoma that had become stage four cancer with five tumors that were rapidly growing. And when Alden left the room to go to the restroom, the surgeon told me, the Harvard surgeon told me he thought that Alden might only have two months left to live. And I said immediately, oh my God, do not say that in his presence. We are not going to tell him that. And, um, and he said, okay, if you, you know, if that's your wishes. And I said, yes. And um, when we went home, you know, they, they gave him some horrible choices, you know, where we knew it would be a miserable life. And he said, I'm not doing any of them. And, um, and I'm not advocating one way or the other because people have lived doing all allopathic, all um, traditional medicine and live to tell the tale. And it's a wonderful story too. But in this case, his options were terrible. And we decided that we, we knew a lot about natural medicine and we would try and save his life at home and turn this around. And one of the things that we did was we called a friend, a woman that we knew who was a therapist. And, and she said, she reminded us of what we already know. She said, well, you believe as I do that love is the most powerful force in the universe. We believe that it's more powerful than power itself. And so she said, I suggest that since cancer is such a low and negative vibration, that you try giving love to the tumors. They were all under his ear in the parotid gland. And she said, I suggest you give them love. And so part of his treatment was each day he would sit for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, put his hand over the five rapidly growing tumors and he would sing 
the word hue to them. He would chant hue and give them love and he would give all of the cells permission to transmute into perfectly normal, healthy cells. And he did that every day. And at the same time, we used energy medicine, we used herbals, we used homeopathics, we used all kinds of things. Um, later, when we had a miraculous healing at two and a half months, all the tumors disappeared, all the cancer went away. And now we were being invited to meet with the lead oncologist in San Diego at University UCSD, UCSD in San Diego. And, um, and she was very excited. She goes, oh, I wanna hear about everything that you did. And we began to tell her. And my husband stopped and he said, you know, can I ask, why are you so excited about this? Because most doctors are like, eh, I don't know. I don't even know what you're talking about. And she said, I feel like I'm sitting in the presence of the future of medicine. She said, when you're talking about vibration and energy, that is the future of medicine. And she said, and we don't know it. And even if we could have cured you, we have no cure for the cancer you have. That's why all your options were so bad. But even if we could have cured you, we could not do it and not do harm. We would have harmed you. You came out of this healthier than you've ever been before. And you got rid of all the cancer. We don't even understand it. But this is the future of medicine. So we were delighted to share with her the things that we did. And she admitted, quite frankly, it'll be 10 years at least before we'll get to use any of this with our patients, because she said, we're experimenting with a very little bit of it with dogs. And she said, that's as far as we've gotten. And that's as far as we're going to get for a while with the drug companies kind of, you know, calling the shots the way things will be. But for us, it was miraculous two and a half months later, my husband had no tumors. Those lumps on his neck just one day disappeared. I said, oh my God, he's shaving. Look at that. And so we went to the doctor to say, did they go internal or did we somehow get rid of them? This was our Harvard surgeon. And he, he started shaking and holding onto the chair. And he said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. What happened? And we began to explain it. And he, had, he said, I have to sit down. He's young, handsome man. He had no idea what we were talking about. He's the one who sent us to meet the research librarian. I mean, the research oncologist, because he said, you're over my head. This is beyond my pay grade. I don't even know what you're talking about, vibrational medicine. But I'm telling you, that is a key to, um, to everything from our perspective. Um, you know, I, I see the chat here and um, I hope you'll all read it. I think I've taken enough time here to share everything that, that I have to share. And I just wanna again, thank you, Diane Willis. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me as a guest and I appreciate it and I appreciate everyone who attended. And I hope you'll share the video with other people and make sure that, um, if you can, that you give a donation to um, Ion Chicago too, because I know that you, you fund yourself and do this work and get your videos on YouTube and get this message out there um, with the donations you receive. So I really applaud you, Diane, and thank you again for the opportunity to be here today with everyone. Oh, Ann, can you hear me now, Vicki? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I just, I am so grateful. <laughs> exactly what you said was exactly what needed to be said. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. I thank really appreciate it. We can't thank you thank enough. Thank you both. Thank and, you. Uh, I think we, we are very, very blessed. It was perfect. And I, you know, I ask my guides always for the speakers and they always provide the speakers. And you came to me, you called me, and I knew right away when I heard your voice that you were our speaker. And I am so, so grateful. It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you're you. very welcome. I'm very grateful to be a part of this and glad for the work that you do. And thank you, Vicki Nelson, for the help that you gave today and that you continue to give Chicago Ions and to Diane. She really needs and, and appreciates the support, I know. And I'm glad to be with you, Diane, again. Thank you. I love my first visit with you. I love being back again. And, and thank you for today. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it in person again in the future at some point. I would love that. Thank you. I wanted to, to mention before we close, thank you for mentioning the don donations. We do go um, by donations and we have collected very little in the best last three years. Um, my guides uh, have been absolutely spectacular. They provided so that we had a little cushion so we've been able to exist even without many donations. But people need to know that we still do need those do donations and you can go to our website on the homepage and, and uh, find out how to, to make that happen. And um, I wanted to mention also that our speaker next month is J uh, Jacob Cooper. Uh, this is his book. I don't know if you can, can you see it? Not it's called, quite. It's called Life After Breath. And he's also a near-death experience and I think you will enjoy him very much. And so I hope you'll join us always. We're on the second Saturday of every month. And we look forward to being back with you all at that time. Thank you. I am just overwhelmed with joy. It was wonderful. Just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody, for now. Thank you. Bye, everybody.